So this talk is going to continue the theme of how the large traditional corporates are interfacing with the clean tech community. And there's been no more important a corporate in the clean tech industry than GE, whose imagination initiative has generated a whopping $106 billion in revenue since launching in 2005. We are very fortunate to have Mark Vachon, the leader of GE's Eco-Imagination program with us to deliver a keynote address. He's been with GE for 29 years, currently a GE corporate officer, member of GE's corporate executive council. Before taking the lead on the GE Eco-Imagination program, Mark actually helped spearhead GE's Healthy Imagination Initiative, which is really the healthcare parallel to Eco-Imagination. He served as president and CEO of GE Healthcare's $9 billion Americas region. Prior to working in healthcare, he provided leadership in a number of other GE businesses, including Global Research, GE Appliances, NBC, uh, Investor Relations. I couldn't ask for a better closer for the summer. Join me in welcoming Mark Vachon, head of GE's Eco-Imagination. Well, good afternoon. You should conclude that the first thing I couldn't do is actually keep a job there without resume. I've assessed what this crowd is, and I determined that it's uh, the non-golfing community who didn't have a flight, right? So uh, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I would thank you for the invitation. Really appreciate it. This is a, a, an important agenda. It's my first, but hopefully not my last. I think uh, the more we sort of digest where we are and where we need to go, uh, the better, better things will go. So thanks so much for that. I, I do want to introduce uh, my colleague, Kevin Skillerin, who is the Managing Director of Energy Financial Services. Kevin, please stand up. He's the guy you need to know. Okay. He has a beautiful voice, I heard. Oh, really? Did we get that on film? Um, look, noon as your uh, dessert, so to speak. Um, first, um, how does GE think about uh, investing in this space? And our definition, you'll see, is probably a little bit broader than, than this community. That's okay, but I think you, you need to know that too. I'll spend a little bit of time uh, on the role of partnerships. Um, that's a, a theme I heard over the last uh, day or and a half or so. Uh, how we're thinking about it, how we're developing some new muscles there, to be very frank. Um, how we're accelerating the adoption of these technologies. And I'm going to share with you sort of a new process we're going through that might be of interest to you. I think we're all focused on how do we scale, not just establish partnerships. Um, and I'm going to keep my remarks very short, in case you actually do have to catch a flight, uh, to 15 minutes. What I'd really like to do, rather than have a diatribe, is have a dialogue. So uh, I'll do that. I am not here to give a commercial on eco-imagination, uh, but if you'll uh, indulge me for just a couple of seconds, I think it's important you understand the context by which I come to this podium, and that is the leader of eco-imagination established seven years ago. Uh, yes, in part as a response to the science which we believe called climate change. Uh, but frankly, we've moved on very quickly from that, uh, frankly, seven years ago. Uh, it is a macro dynamic that we put into our planning process long, long ago. And I think, frankly, companies who don't run the risk of irrelevance and missing mass, massive markets. Um, so it's all about this idea that uh, as 10 billion people populate this earth very quickly here, all demanding improved standard of living, just like all of us, um, GE is going to be around to help rebuild that infrastructure, but must do it with a greater sensitivity to natural resource productivity. And it's also about using the wep of weapon of innovation, uh, of which you all are absolutely essential in delivering, to eliminate this concept of a false choice this false choice between pick one, great economics or great environmental performance. We think that's absolutely nonsense, that through innovation we can have both. And in the process, grow faster. And so that's what eco-imagination is about. That's how we come to work every day. That's how we think about investment in, in technology and beyond. How's it been working? Frankly, a lot better than we thought it would be. Uh, over $100 billion in revenue inside the Eco-Imagination portfolio program to date. It is growing at 2x the rest of the GE portfolio. I think that's very important to, to focus on because the value proposition created by delivering both of those 
marketplace design signals, economics and environment says, you grow faster. And that's what we're all about. If you don't get it for climate change science, get it for great economics and business. We've also reduced our footprint dramatically across the three elements of water, greenhouse gas, and energy. And frankly, I've saved over $130 million doing it. So we kind of love it. So that's the context by which I, I make my remarks here today. Let me now move into describing what sort of flavor of investor we are. Last year, we spent $11 billion in acquisitions in the energy-related um, industries uh, across the board. Um, companies like Dresser, Converteam, The Wood Group, Lineage, now, I would have to quickly say this is not an annual run rate, but I do think it's important for me to mention because it shows that we are incredibly committed to rebuilding the energy infrastructure here on planet Earth. And that foundation, along with, of course, other organizations throughout the world, provides somewhat of a base for all of us to innovate around, which is incredibly important. I think as I move on, you'll get that. We, spend, we will spend $10 billion between 2010 and 2015 on both energy and water technologies in this space. But also, we do do a reasonable amount of acquisitions and control investments into multiple early stage technology companies uh, concentrated, frankly, over the last 18 months. Companies you might know like Calnatex, Lightech, Prime Star, eSolar, FMC Tech, a company that came out of the Eco-Imagination Challenge, which I'll explain what that is here in a second. Last year we did 27 deals, 13 were new inside 2011. The broad buckets of investments you might be interested in knowing, uh, first, renewables, second, the broad space of digital energy and energy efficiency, and the third in the general category of natural resources. You might think biofuels and others in that space. We launched a $300 million joint venture, I don't know if Rich Germain is here from Conoco Phillips, one of our partners, as well as Ener NRG Energy. The basic idea there is to pool ourselves together, and frankly, not just money, but a platform to actually commercialize and test out innovations. And that's going incredibly well. We were awarded the Clean Tech Group Corporation of the Year last year, and that's sort of a volume metric, but it does, I think, say uh, we're in on this. So that's the kind of investor we are. We're pretty committed to the space. And although public markets have clearly been uh, difficult over the last recent period, I think it's important to hear from us that we're still very bullish, uh, the realization that we haven't solved these problems, they haven't gone away, so therefore the innovation and the technology that's represented in all of what you, you do and represent actually gets increasingly more important over time as the problem gets more intense. So that's sort of the section on what kind of investor are we? How do we think about investing in this space? Um, it is at the core of what our clients are looking for. If you think about where that $10 billion of R&D is going, it's making organizations like utilities, airlines, railroads more productive, but also increasingly helping them with either regulatory dynamics that have to impact their sustainability metrics or self-inspired metrics. And so this is not tangential to what we do. It is actually at the core of the value proposition we bring to our customer base. And so that's why we're committed to it. With regard to that R&D, I, I just take one brief sideline here that might be of interest to you. Uh, as Iris said, I, I actually started my career almost 30 years ago at the Global Research Center. I won't describe the very mundane tasks I had at that time. But what I did observe is incredible R&D in centers of excellence across all kinds of technologies. And as I continually go back in admittedly different capacities, um, I've realized quite a transformation on how R&D has progressed. And I want to share this with you. And it has to do with the multidisciplinary and multifunctional approach to problem solving that may be relevant to you as an investor in a technology. How beneficial it's been to be able to draw on an aerospace engineer, a material scientist, a mechanical engineer from those COEs I knew so long ago and ask them not to develop solutions inside those silos but to work together to optimize around 
the efficiency and effectiveness of a wind turbine. Too often, the problems are suboptimized inside those technologies, and we're finding tremendous progress, in this case, getting down the cost curve to grid parity and wind, by multidisciplinary approaches. I'll give you another one. Bringing together our battery scientists, our smart charging organization, our smart grid organization, one of the largest fleet leasing businesses we have out there, not to individually develop their competency or contribution in the marketplace, but to optimize in that ecosystem so that, for example, the city of San Diego can adopt EVs without having to deal with, for example, six different sales forces. I bring that up because as you sort of try and progress your companies, your innovation, it's incredibly important, at least when you're talking to organizations like us, is to put that technology and innovation into the context of the ecosystem by which our clients, the folks who are trying to drive value, see that. And I think the more we can articulate that competency, frankly, the, f the more obvious that value proposition becomes. Now look, the core of our resources um, will go into technology development, frankly, for organic growth. 1,500 PhDs located in five different global research centers throughout the world, and of course, all the business level technologists. But, here's the good news. Increasingly, we've come to understand that, shockingly, all good ideas are not inside the four walls of GE. And so, <laughs> yes, thank you, Plod, right? Only took us 130 years. So at the five-year anniversary of Ecoimagination, which actually happened just a year ago, we paused and said, where are we taking this thing? And to be honest, given the situation, we'd have a right to sort of take a time out. But credit to my CEO, Jeff Femmel, he doubled down. He said, we're going to double the R&D in this space. We're going to commit to growing the revenue inside this Ecoimagination portfolio, now numbering 135 different products and services. And we're going to say, double the growth rate of the rest of the company. We're going to double the reduction in our footprint. But maybe the most important and challenging to our organization was that we were going to open up the company. That these problems are much larger than any one organization. I think we all know that. And therefore, the ability to develop skill sets in partnering and open innovation is incredibly important. And so 18 months ago, we took 100 million of our own money, 100 million of four venture capital firms, one of them is uh, Rockport here in the audience, thank you, and put it together and said, we're going to create an open innovation mechanism. And uh, wow, we, we really caught the bus. Uh, a community of 70,000 interested parties. We reviewed over 5,000 business plans, Kevin did most of them, uh, in a very short amount of time, which is also incredibly important. This is not a process that is well honed, and it's about speed, it's about responsiveness. Um, we spent the money, um, funded a few dozen type partnerships, and I would tell you that the, the, the makeup of those partnerships ranged from pure acquisition, which to be very honest is our normal reaction, we love your technologies, how much, to what about distribution agreements? So a company in Sweden who really just wants access to our global distribution that we've built up over a hundred years is fine in terms of a partnership. So it's been incredibly successful. I just reviewed the next iteration of that. By the way, we focused it a little bit, first on the smart grid, first on energy efficiency in the home, and still got incredibly robust and diverse technologies. We just rolled one out in China. As we all know, the 12th five-year plan in China couldn't be more clear on where they're going. It includes a diversity of resources, including gas, which they have an incredible capacity with. So we rolled out a Ecoimagination Challenge in China to get after technologies that can help them get access to that natural resource. So it's been a, it's been a wonderful mechanism, an incredible amount of learnings, and I, and I can tell the, you know, our relationships with VCs and others and, and some of these firms can tell you that we're still learning how to dance as a very large elephant with very small animals, um, admittedly. I would tell you, though, we, we also learned, this, this really hit me, um, that although it's been wildly successful on the goal of getting partnerships into the funnel, it doesn't do a whole lot for getting them through the funnel and scale. 
And so I want to share with you what we've done from the Eco-Imagination Challenge. And it's sort of early days, but I'm very encouraged by it, and that's why I share it with you. And that is the Eco-Imagination Innovation Accelerator. So this is a pot of money, not a lot, $20 million, that I get to dole out and specifically focus, and focus is the key, on key partners that we want to sort of drag through that funnel and scale commercially. Get them to take advantage of that global distribution our technology competency, the business depth inside each of those businesses. The early results have been phenomenal. The first three pilots, I can't mention them here today, unfortunately, I will shortly, have, have delivered over $600 million of incremental revenue and a lot sooner than we would have. We put a target out there to do a billion of incremental revenue from this process by 2015. And the timeline is also, I think, special. This process, in its natural course of events, two years. These three have gone through in six months. So I, I'm very, very, very excited about it. A um, couple other examples that came out of the Eco Imagination Challenge you might be interested in. Uh, New Ventex, a leader in cooling techniques for LED lighting, is working with our lighting business to develop the next gen LEDs. Project Frog, better, faster, cheaper green buildings. We have a show site at our Leadership Development Institute in Crotonville, New York. So we're working together on how can we bring the GE portfolio inside that facility to make it even more valuable to our customers. Scientific Conservation is partnering with our real estate business on six different pilots throughout Europe and the US. Concert is now included in our digital energy offering around smart grid as a surface for municipal and cooperative utilities in the US. And so, I'm not here in front of you saying the elephant can dance uh, real quick. Trust me, um, 130 years of muscle um, can atrophy in this relationship. But what I am telling you is uh, a couple of things. Uh, we're committed to it. Uh, we believe partnerships is incredibly important. Uh, but not just starting the relationship, scaling and accelerating. If we don't get that part of the equation, there's going to be a lot less interest on the front side of the funnel. So I I'm going to conclude. I'm close to my 15 minutes, um, and I'll, I'll take some questions, which would be great. Look, uh, I know it's been bumpy out there, um, but the need for these technologies will only intensify over time. Remember, we have not solved the problem we set out to solve. It's still there in front of us, but that's good. If we were done, that'd be, that'd be another thing. We're in a challenging time, but for those firms with scale that can weather the storm, and may in the process see valuations become more attractive through this cycle, these are attractive. I, I think the panel earlier said it. I think corporates are going to have an important role and maybe even a more important role uh, in the near to medium term. We see the need to develop our competencies in finding innovation through partnerships, clearly. Um, it's encouraging, uh, but we're not naive. We have a lot to learn here, and you can teach us. But I would just conclude with this final thought, that for the sake of economics and the environment, we must continue to develop these ecosystems between government, academia, venture capital, and business, whether that's big or small business. So uh, I hope uh, there was a nugget in two that might be useful for you. I'll stop there and uh, start that dialogue. Okay, we're going to do some questions. I'd ask that you uh, make the questions brief so that people can get to their flights and not make speeches in your questions. I've been authorized to cut you off. <clears throat> wow, that's loud. I can't hear you. I turned out mine, turned yours down. I'll repeat it if you just, yeah. Got tremendous visibility from generation, transmission, distribution. What, what changes and opportunities do you see in that whole space? Yeah, so if you didn't hear all the questions, so, you know, great visibility in the utilities and distribution and uh, down the value chain. Uh, let me answer generically and then geographically. Um, generically, efficiency is always a high priority for utilities, right? So not only the turbine, but integration with renewables. We just introduced our Flex 50 turbine, which 
is, a, is a, literally a theft from our air, aircraft engine business, right? If you're in a plane, you need variation real quick. That technology is actually very helpful when you're trying to manage intermittent renewable power. Classic example. Distribution, we have a very big presence. You know, we have a history of distribution um, technologies going back literally 100 years. Uh, I, I think uh, the leader of FERC did a very nice job. I, I actually live in Wisconsin, so I, under, I understand what he was actually looking at. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. A lot of challenges, of course, uh, you know, defining what smart grid really is, um, the, the walls that are built in lots of places. Um, so I, I don't see, you know, said another way, I don't see a lack of opportunity anywhere in that generation distribution. The inefficiency in that process is just staggering. You know, I, I did come from the healthcare business, but when I jumped over to the energy space, wow, I thought there was waste in, in the healthcare business. This, this is unprecedented. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's about focus. Geographically, obviously the U.S. is incredibly stalled. We shipped hundreds of gas turbines last year, one in the United States, and we didn't lose market share, <laughs> just FYI. So we have some capacity to run through um, obviously, Asia um, is incredibly robust, Brazil specifically. Um, a lot of dynamics and dominoes that will play off of, you know, geopolitical and major geographical energy movement. You know, where does Germany replace that nuclear power? Uh, you know, that'll be very interesting to see. Um, I would say we're seeing a major macro trend in gas in general. Um, starting here in North America, but cascading all over the world in Australia, China, Poland. That's probably more than you wanted, but same price. Yeah. Thank yes, you. sir. Yeah, so the question was, do we have any interest in residential solar? Uh, yes. You know, you may have been aware that we acquired the other portion of Prime Star, announced a very substantial photovoltaic cattel plant in Colorado, $400 million investment. Um, our, our priority is going to be utility scale, um, but we do have some capability at the residential level. Um, we source most of that for now. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so the question was, um, thank you, uh, we do a good job of leading by example, should Wells Fargo, and uh, I won't speak for Wells Fargo, and by the way, thank you for sponsoring lunch, uh, should we be more engaged in the debate on pricing carbon and climate change? It, uh, we were actually one of the founding members of um, the uh, carbon debate. Jeff Amel, uh, I think, demonstrated incredible leadership and huge personal risk, politically and otherwise, by being very vocal that we should price carbon here in the United States. So we couldn't be any more aggressive on the subject. Um, we believe in that. You know, show me an ecosystem that doesn't have boundaries and you're gonna get bad decisions and generally horizontal movement. Um, and I do think the implications are, you know, companies like us are gonna go where at least there's some clarity, if not tailwind. And so where do I spend my time? 75% outside of the United States. I think we are acting though. I don't think we're putting our pencils down. That's not the indicated action. Indicated action, if there is no policy, we're gonna act. Our policy is to act. And so, for example, we've committed to 15,000 electric vehicles for our own account. We're gonna trans transfer our ICE cars that our salespeople drive to EVs. This year, we got 1,000 of them out there. You'll see another, 2011, you'll see another couple thousand deployed. So we're gonna lead by example, if not affect policy. But I, I don't wanna say that we're gonna disengage, but that was sort of Pavlovian painful. Thank you, I was wondering if you could help resolve a tension that we've seen with small companies looking to work with GE. And the concern sometimes with small emerging companies is because GE has large, uh, uh, a broad spectrum of business sectors and research pockets. Yeah. I'm always concerned that maybe the company might be going to to do homework on them 
when in fact they want to work with GE. So how do you alleviate that concern? Well, it's a great question, and it's, you know, it's probably a, an appropriate response given maybe historical behaviors. I think one of the keys to the eco-imagination challenge is we had to take off the table very early on the threat of absorbing IP because many of the conversations, that was the only asset the organization had, an idea. And so we actually contractually took that off the table early on. I think those kind of techniques is, are, are, are what we got to do. Um, ultimately, you're going to have to decide as, as, a, as an entity whether, you, whether that trust is there or not. I think our job is to, through Eco Challenge, through the Eco Accelerator, through coming to these conferences, develop that trust. We don't, we don't believe it happens overnight, but it is ultimately trust, and, but a, a little contractual dynamics behind it. Uh, tends to build trust. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a very simple question. Good. So <laughs> you're a small company or you're a company looking to, a, to promote a technology. How do you physically go to GE and ask for that assistance? You go two tables over and talk to Kevin. <laughs> All right, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, we're going to do it in a couple ways. We're going to make it easier. This is what Kevin does for a living. He's, he's done a phenomenal job on it. but. We're also, again, creating these sort of networks and opportunities to, to access us. Um, but I, you know, why not now? All right, last question. So Jeffrey Immelt and Bill Gates and others have been very active, urging for more funding for ARPA-E and general R&D uh, innovation in this space. Any prospect for breaking through the partisan gridlock that's been surrounding that, and how can folks here help make that happen? Um, I'd love to give you a sunshiny answer here in this sunshiny environment. I think, you know, the reality is, and we really need to face into this, the global debt crisis is going to have very real and very immediate effects. I mean, it, it is just practical. So, you know, I think that challenges our innovation that much more. Innovations that are based on subsidies and support, I think, are, are that much more challenged. And so we're going to keep arguing. I think RPE's done a phenomenal job. We love it. But um, no, I don't, I don't see happy days in the near term on that one, to be very honest. Thank you for having me. <coughs>